welcome back to Brian's Things That Are Cool. A few months ago, I uploaded a video I did back in college on the life and career of Edward D. Wood Jr. October 10th marks Ed's 100th birthday, and as a huge fan, I wanted to mark this big anniversary with a new video celebrating his legacy and taking a fact versus fiction look at Tim Burton's 1994 masterpiece, Ed Wood. So slip into your Angora sweaters, watch out for string-powered UFOs, here's to 100 years of Ed Wood. My first exposure to Ed was watching a taped off of HBO copy of 1982's It Came From Hollywood that I watched a lot as a kid. It Came From Hollywood was a celebration of B-movies featuring clips from the films themselves as well as sketches and commentary from Dan Aykroyd, John Candy, Cheech and Chong, and Gilda Radner. The film was inspired by the books The Golden Turkey Awards and The 50 Worst Films of All Time by Harry and Michael Medved. The Golden Turkey Awards is the source that named Plan 9 as the worst film of all time, and it can be said that the renewed interest in Ed and his career stems from that book. While Harry and Michael Medved despise the end result of It Came From Hollywood, I still love it. One part of the movie in particular caught my attention way back then. It was a segment featuring John Candy, who I was familiar with from The Great Outdoors, talking about this filmmaker that was supposedly the worst of all time in a segment titled A Salute to Edward D. Wood Jr. It was my first time hearing about Ed, and I still crack up watching the part when Dan Aykroyd comes in at the end of the segment. Climb on. Maybe we can work it out together. Things were silent for me for a few years on the Ed Wood front, with the only reference being a clip of Plan 9 being used at Walt Disney World's Sci-Fi Diner. With its 50s drive-in setting, fun monster movie posters and props, and tables made to look like 50s cars, it's my favorite restaurant at Disney, and partially responsible for my love of 50s sci-fi films. Then in 1994, Tim Burton released the biopic Ed Wood, and that was really what got me hooked. More on the film itself a little later, but the film inspired me to seek out the real Ed's films. I bought his three most famous films in a pink Angora box set, I bought Rudolph Gray's Nightmare of Ecstasy, The Life and Art of Edward D. Wood Jr., watched the Ed Wood episode of E's Mysteries and Scandals with A.J. Benza, and even poured over magazine articles about him and famous monsters of filmland. By this point, I had reached my teen years, and it was time I share my obsession. I was able to get two of my friends interested, and we'd have viewing parties. One friend in particular and I would spend many weekends seeking out B-grade horror films. Everything from Ice Cream Man, Jack Frost, Uncle Sam Wants You Dead, to the Leprechaun movies. When we found out there was a local store that specialized in horror films, we had to check it out. Diabolic was an independent video store in my hometown back in the 90s, and they didn't just have some Ed Wood movies, they had an entire section just for Ed Wood. We rented everything we could get our hands on. Night of the Ghouls, Orgy of the Dead, The Vinyl Ears, and more. For my 17th birthday, my friend bought me my very own VHS copy of Orgy of the Dead. Blending beautiful naked zombie girls, vampires, vixens, wanton werewolves, tortured teens, and bondage, starring Criswell and Ghoulita. Still a classic. I still have fond memories of me and my friends quoting lines from the movies, and as a goof joining the online Church of Ed Wood. As I recall, my baptism name was Lobo. It's amazing what you could find on the internet back then. In 1994, Tim Burton released a biopic, Ed Wood, and in one of the coolest movie-going experiences of my life, I got to see it in Hollywood. My family was on vacation at the time, and among other adventures, like watching them film a scene from the 1995 Ray Fine sci-fi flick Strange Days, and seeing Brennan Fraser shopping for music at Tower Records, we took in a movie. I knew very little about Ed at the time, but the movie instantly grabbed me. Tim Burton's Ed Wood is a condensed Hollywoodized version of real life events, so I'd like to compare fact versus fiction for some key moments in the film. This is in no way to demean the film, as I absolutely love it, and I'm not going to cover every inaccuracy. This will be a general overview of the movie that'll give a little bit more story and hopefully fill in a few gaps. Burton's Ed Wood takes us through the behind the scenes stories of filming Glen or Glenda, Bride of the Monster, and Plan 9 from Outer Space, as well as a number of key moments from the personal lives of Ed and his acquaintances. Burton's film opens in October of 1948, with Ed debuting his stage play, The Casual Company. The Casual Company was a play Ed wrote based on a service in the United States Marine Corps, 
and opened at the Village Playhouse to negative reviews. The film says theater reviewer Victor Crowley didn't show up for press night and sent his copy boy to see the play and write the review. This was close to reality, but in a letter to his father, the real Ed said the drama reviewer was a Mr. Bromfield and chastises the copy boy for trying to make his career by turning in a bad review. Despite claiming in a letter to his father that they were staying afloat, Ed spent all of the earnings from the play, and it closed after a week or so. Before jumping into Glen or Glenda as depicted in the film, Ed did another stage play as an actor this time, portraying the villain in The Black Guard Returns, for which he was literally paid in beer and pretzels. The same year as Casual Company in The Black Guard Returns, Ed wrote and directed a low-budget western called Crossroads of Laredo, with a friend and producer John Crawford Thomas. The film was shot in two or three days at a ranch they rented for $60 a day, and shot silent with a plan to go back and later dub dialogue. The film was edited and had music added decades later and included as a special feature on the Ed Wood documentary, The Haunted World of Ed Wood. John Crawford Thomas burned through all the money they had to keep the film going, but once the money had run out, Ed was gone. Ed's first job as a hired director followed, a TV melodrama called The Sun Was Setting, which is notable for having TV's first Lois Lane, Phyllis Coates, in the cast. Within the casual company scene in Burton's film, we meet Bunny Breckenridge, played by Bill Murray. Bunny was openly gay and a drag queen who performed in Paris in his younger years under the name Jacques Solange. At the time he met Ed, he was a house guest of Wood's friend Paul Marco, Kelton the Cop from Plan 9. Bunny went on to play the alien ruler in that film. As Burton's film mentions, Bunny did in fact plan to go to Mexico and have a sex change operation but got into an accident on the way which killed his lover, and he gave up on the idea. While Burton's film ends with Plan 9 being a triumph, that wasn't exactly the case, and Bunny had his own bad luck when shortly after the film's premiere he was convicted on 10 counts of perversion and committed to the Atascadrio State Hospital for the Criminally Insane, where he served a year. Bunny died in 1996, leaving behind a obituary that read, I was a little bit wild when I was young, darling, but I lived my life grandly. After the casual company portion of the film, Burton depicts the making of Glen or Glenda. It's revealed here that Ed is a transvestite as he answers an ad seeking a writer and director for an exploitation film about the first sex change operation, Christine Jorgensen. As depicted in the biopic, Glen or Glenda very quickly changed from a sex change flick to one about transvestitism. The film claims Jorgensen demanded money for portrayal rights, but Ed himself said that Jorgensen refused to have any films made at all, and even refused to do lecture tours. In a comical scene in Burton's film, Ed meets Bella Lugosi outside a coffin shop where Bella is shopping for a casket. In reality, Ed met Bella in 1952 through his friend, writer and producer Alex Gordon, who gave us such classics as Girls in Prison from 1956, The She Creature from 1956, Shake, Rattle, and Rock from 1956, and Reform School Girl from 1957. Gordon helped create American International Pictures with Samuel Z. Arkov. George Weiss in Burton's film is depicted as being angry with Ed due to the end result of Glenn or Glenda, going so far as to say, And if I ever see you again, I'll kill you! In reality, Weiss said very little negative about Ed, and I'd even say he stood up for him. Weiss felt that Samuel Z. Arkov didn't have much respect for Ed, but took a lot of his ideas. As Weiss said of Ed, the dope let everybody read his scripts. That's how trusting he was. Samuel Arkov was a little less eloquent in his assessment of Ed, saying, If you had clients like Ed Wood, you'd have to feel like a street cleaner following an errant horse. Burton's film is correct in showing Weiss having issues selling the picture to certain territories, and Glenn or Glenda didn't make a profit but there certainly wasn't the animosity shown in the biopic. In reality, Weiss put up the money for another project of Ed's, a juvenile delinquent film called Hellborn, which was never completed, though Ed later used the footage in films The Sinister Urge and Night of the Ghouls. Burton's film also shows Ed being able to get Bella on board to play the god character in Glenna Glenda rather quickly. According to Ed himself, it took some convincing as Bella turned it down flat. The initial offer Weiss made to cast Bella was $500, but according to Ed, Bella and Lillian, Bella's wife, came to him saying they'd do it for a thousand, and Weiss agreed. This being another contradiction between the film and reality, in the film, Lillian had already left Bella before the events of the film. At the start of filming Glenn and Glenda, Bella had yet to divorce Lillian, 
though they had separated in 1944. It's also implied in the film that Bella was alone at the time of his death. Bella did actually remarry a year before his death to a fan named Hope Lineger, who was 37 years younger than him. Bella met Hope when she wrote letters to him while he was in rehab. There are a number of moments Burton chose to portray in the film that have a ring of truth to them, but didn't exactly happen the way they were shown. For instance, the scene depicting Bella getting thrown off by an actor ad-libbing during a skit on TV actually happened years before Bella even met Ed. Probably the most important contradiction to point out between Martin Lando's Bella and the real Bella is that according to multiple sources, including his son Bella Jr., Forrest Ackerman of Famous Monsters of Filmland, and Dolores Fuller, Lugosi never used profanity. So while this... Fuck you! Carlos does not deserve to smell my shit! ...is an entertaining moment in the film, it's pretty far from the truth. There are at least two other films that Burton chose not to talk about in his film. Jailbait from 1954, which fell between Glenn or Glenda and Bride of the Monster, and Violent Years from 1956, which fell between Bride of the Monster and Plan 9. So the film jumps from Glenn or Glenda to the making of Bride of the Monster. In the biopic, they rightfully depict Ed finding the funding for the film himself. The reality of how everything went down is a little muddy, however. Ed claimed later that the film's star, Loretta King, had millions of dollars and was allergic to liquids. Dolores Fuller claimed that Bride of the Monster was short by $60,000, and that Loretta came through with the money getting Dolores' part in the process. Loretta claimed she never had the money, and was never even approached by Ed or anyone else about funding the production, figuring she had gotten the part because Ed didn't want someone in the role he was involved with. Dolores had been in both Glen or Glenda and Jailbait, so I questioned that. Loretta also said the rumor of her being allergic to liquids was false as well. Whatever the truth, the film had a rocky on-again, off-again production schedule as money kept running out, until Donald McCoy, the owner of a meatpacking plant, put up the full amount under the condition that his son Tony be cast as the film's hero, and that the film itself end in a giant explosion. This was depicted quite accurately in Burton's film. The most famous scene from Bride of the Monster is arguably the octopus scene, which Burton recreates very well. The octopus, as Burton shows, was indeed stolen by Ed for the finale. In reality, it was property of Republic Studios, and had been used in 1948's Wake of the Red Witch. Not only did they forget to steal the motor to make the creature's leg move, they also lost one of its legs, taking it down from the ceiling of the studio's warehouse. In Burton's film, we see a reenactment of the Home I Have No Home speech from Bride of the Monster. Burton primarily tried to give the audience a positive depiction of Ed's life, but the true story behind the day they filmed this sequence is rather dark. The man portraying Professor Strausky, the foreign agent sent to bring Dr. Eric Vornoff home, was played by an actor named George Bacquar. He worked for a single day on the picture and didn't like how much he got paid, so he reported Ed to the Screen Actors Guild, shutting down production in the process. The result got Ed in trouble with his financial backers, and he actually ended up losing the rights to the film. Ed hated George Bacar to his dying day. The premiere of Bride of the Monster was held at Paramount Theater, and from what I can tell, it wasn't as insane as depicted in Burton's film, but it wasn't well received, which upset Ed. The part where Martin Landau's Bella gives Dr. Eric Bornoff's speech on a street corner did actually happen, however, according to Ed. I have no home. After the reenactment of Bella's street performance, Burton begins the final act of the film, depicting the crazy behind-the-scene antics of Ed's most famous film, Plan 9 from Outer Space. The film depicts Ed meeting Kathy while Bella is in rehab. In reality, Ed met Kathy O'Hara in a bar one night where he was drinking with Bella. It was love at first sight for Kathy, and they were married shortly after in Vegas. Not mentioned in the film is that Ed had just recently married and annulled his marriage with Norma McCarty, who plays the stewardess in Plan 9. When you come out on your wedding night and your new bride's nighty, that tends to be a deal breaker for some women. Lugosi did indeed enter drug rehab in late 1955, as shown in the film. Ed attempted to raise money for his hospital expenses by holding a fundraiser, but according to Vampira, nobody showed up. The news of Lugosi's rehab stint hit Frank Sinatra hard, and Old Blue Eyes personally went to the hospital to hand Lugosi a $1,000 check, despite never meeting him before. 
Lugosi was released from the hospital and gave an interview stating that his next feature would be a film directed by his friend Ed Wood called The Ghoul Goes West. Ed shot some random B-roll footage with no plot in mind of Bella standing outside of Tor Johnson's house. Not Bella's house as implied in Burton's film. And then later, graveyard footage, which was for another unproduced script of Ed's called The Vampire's Tomb. Despite this being the footage that shows up in Plan 9, Lugosi's actual last film would be director Reginald Aboard's horror picture, The Black Sleep, which came out in the summer of 1956. Bella died of a heart attack on August 16, 1956. As Burton shows, Bella was buried in his full Dracula costume. After the funeral sequence in Burton's film, we meet Ed's landlord, J. Edward Reynolds, telling Ed he needs his rent check, which clearly Ed didn't have the money to cover. Reynolds mentions that his church wishes to make a film series on the Twelve Apostles, but only have the money for one, which gives Ed the idea to sell him on the idea of financing his script for grave robbers from outer space. Not only did J. Edward Reynolds and his church finance the picture, but Reynolds and his associate appear in the film as gravediggers. Burton's film gets things pretty close on Reynolds and the Baptist involvement in Plan 9. In reality, Reynolds actually wished to make a biopic on evangelist Billy Sunday, and then a series of religious films. Much like Burton shows, a condition of their contract was that the cast had to be baptized before filming began. In an interview, Ed said that when it came to being baptized, Tor Johnson decided to play a joke on the Reverend, and when he was dunked in the water, he stayed under, which scared the Reverend thinking he had just drowned him. Burton recreates the sets during the Plan 9 segment perfectly, and the inaccuracies are minor, but there are a few. It wasn't Bunny that suggested that the aliens look a little less human in the film, but makeup man Harry Thomas. Thomas had already made elongated prosthetic chins for the actors, as well as cat-eye contact lenses and wanted to spray the costumes with illuminated paint. He figured it would take 15 to 20 minutes for each actor to get them ready for the scene. But Ed refused, saying he didn't have the time. Harry Thomas asked to have his name taken off the film. That's why the makeup is credited to his assistant, Tom Bartholomew, in the film's credits. It should also be said that Ed never came out to direct in full drag, nor did he go to a bar and meet Orson Welles. Sources close to Ed say that the only film he directed scenes while in drag was Glen or Glenda, and for an obvious reason, he was also starring in the film. There was never an on-set blow-up with the Baptists, only a few personal matters between Ed and J. Edward Reynolds. Reynolds did take umbrage to a few items in the script, and it seems he was aware of Ed's transvestitism, which he didn't feel was good for the church. They did have a pretty ugly falling out later, but that was a landlord-slash-renter issue. I've never come across any evidence of Ed having met Orson Welles, but he was a great admirer. However, Orson Welles did have a relationship with Vampyra, and his cameraman, Ray Flynn, was a good friend of Ed's. In fact, Flynn shot some of the better composed scenes of Crossroads of Laredo. Burton ends the film on a triumphant note, a big premiere for Plan 9 at the Pantages Theater in Hollywood. Ed and Kathy arrive slightly late in a rainstorm, but are greeted with thunderous applause as Ed and members of the cast proudly watch all their hard work on the big screen. Ed remarks, This is the one. This is the one I'll be remembered for. It's a powerful ending, and rather inspiring for anyone who's seen a lot of adversity, but continued to move forward. Unfortunately, it's not entirely accurate. Ed did arrive to the premiere in a rainstorm, but the premiere was held at the Carlton Theater in Los Angeles on March 15, 1957. It was a positive night, but Gregory Walcott, who portrayed the hero in Plan 9, remembered feeling sorry for J. Edward Reynolds, because he was having issues selling the film to distributors. Eventually, Hal Roach agreed to release it, but Reynolds got nothing for it and died a few years later. There's a gag in this part of the film with Tor and his family, his wife and two young children, all of hulking size. In reality, Tor's son Carl was an adult at the time that Plan 9 was made, and was a lieutenant for the LAPD. Carl actually provided the police cars used in Plan 9. Plan 9 from Outer Space would go on to have more success in TV re-airings than its initial theatrical release. But true to Johnny Depp's line at the end of the film, Ed was truly proud of Plan 9. Ed would later say, If you want to know me, see Glen or Glenda. That's me. That's my story. No question. But Plan 9 is my pride and joy.
Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed my tribute to Ed on his 100th birthday. If you'd like to be kept up to date as to when I release a new video, go ahead, hit that subscribe button. And if you really want to be notified, hit that bell as well. I'm Brian, and happy 100th birthday, Ed. God help us in the future.